This is from Daria. She's from the University of Nottingham and the Hampstead Research. And her talk will be on innovating insect processing technology and the enrichment of traditional foods. So it is kind of starting to think about things like technology and scaling up um, from traditional to uh, the technological world. So. Okay. Um, all right, so as I've been introduced, my name is Daria, and I'm going to be talking about innovating insect technology to tackle malnutrition. Um, I say malnutrition because although we tend to focus on undernutrition in this case, parts of it do also apply to overnutrition. Um, so first, what I'm going to look at quickly is just a bit of a background on nutrition in general. So there's two main types of um, undernutrition that you are faced with. The biggest one is um, protein energy deficiency, or what's also often called chronic hunger. Um, and that's d just due to insufficient calories. So this is where you see things like stunting, um, where you have people who are, their height for age is uh, two standard deviations or more away. Um, and then wasting is where your weight for height is also, again, two standard deviations away. Um, so this is something that um, affects more than 20% of women of reproductive age in developing countries. Um, and then you also have several million children who are stunted and wasted. And you have, this then has a lot of trickle-down effects. So women who are stunted have a 40% higher risk of having infant death. Um, you also have a lot more maternal mortality and morbidity associated with it. And you get a very complex intergenerational cycle once you start in malnutrition. Um, and so it basically looks like this. This is what's been drawn up. So you can kind of jump in at any stage and see how, you know, if you have a baby that's born with a low birth weight, then has inadequate time to catch up, you have frequent infections, you have a stunted child, you have a stunted adolescent, um, and then you have malnourished pregnant women, low pregnancy weight gain, they are inadequately able to grow a fetus, and then they also are not able to care for the baby properly, and you just keep going around in this cycle. Um, and so there's really a lot of points of intervention possible in this cycle, um, and predominantly these interventions have been focused kind of in the baby age, um, rather than which a lot of people suggest is better focusing them kind of in this area, so getting pregnant women healthy um, so that you're not starting with a low birth weight child. The next thing is then what is also called hidden hunger or micronutrient deficiencies. This is the part that can affect people who are undernourished as well as overnourished. So you do see this in a lot of developing countries where there's been a huge surplus of highly processed, low-nutrient foods, you have obesity, um, so they're definitely not insufficient on calories, but you then are faced with a lot of the micronutrient deficiencies still. Uh, specifically in this project, we are focusing on iron deficiency and zinc deficiency. Um, the reason for that being, as we've seen in a lot of the statistics, insects, uh, particularly what we work with, crickets, are fairly stably high in iron um, and also zinc. Um, so globally, you have upwards of 200 million children that are under five and are anemic. Um, you also have approximately 20% of the maternal deaths in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia are due to anemia. Um, and you also have lots of people who are zinc deficient, um, again, putting people at increased risk of low birth weights and stillbirths. Um, there is at least one million child deaths that are caused by uh, zinc and vitamin A deficiency. Um, and then early iron deficiency is linked to cognitive deficits. Um, and again, this has tons of trickle-down effects into, you know, if someone is micronutrient deficiency and then have diarrhea, um, those, that micronutrient deficiency then can actually cause death because they're not able to overcome something that is generally seen as a fairly kind of simple illness. Um, the interventions to this generally have been focused on supplementation. So very simply, someone comes in and says, all right, there's a micronutrient deficiency, let's just give everyone iron and zinc pills, problem solved. Not that simple. Um, you have a lot of stigmas around taking pills, um, very low adherence to these programs. People think, why do I need to take a pill if I'm healthy? It doesn't make sense. Um, there's also the problem that with things like iron pills, they tend to have negative side effects. They don't taste good. If you put powders on food, it alters the taste. Um, it's also a very unsustainable intervention. You constantly need someone putting in money to provide this supplement, um, so it becomes very costly. So one of the alternatives to doing a direct supplementation is looking at fortification options. So if you take traditional foods and work to fortify them, um, either through selective breeding or using a different food to mix in, you have a lot more positive results, um, particularly from a cost perspective. If you look at the cost of fortification um, in dollars over the disability years that you save, you see that the fortification is going to cost you roughly half or even less of what paying for supplementation would cost you. 
um, per year. So I'm going to show you three maps quickly now. Um, I promise they're not the same map, just in three different colors. Um, so just to kind of make a note of where these colors are. Um, so the first map that I've showed you actually is the stunting of children under five years old. And so you can see it's very, very heavily concentrated in that sub-Saharan Africa, Western and Eastern Africa region, and then also in Asia. The second map is the FAO hunger map. So this is the number of people, the percentage of the population is undernourished. Again, very heavily concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa and Western and Eastern Africa and also a bit in Asia um, and a little bit in South America. This final map is the documented edible insect species map. Um, and so this kind of threefold of maps is where this idea for this project spurred from. Because again, you can see the majority of the edible insect species are also concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Western Africa, um, South America, and a bit of Asia. Um, so if you take all of these facts together, so you have a high levels of undernourishment, particularly mul multiple micronutrients, um, you have a lot of food insecurity in these countries. The food security is very volatile and we're very weather dependent. Um, so you can have crops that go bad very quickly. Um, you have a lot of subsistence and smallholder farmers. So there's a lot of farmers that are just growing for themselves or for a small market farm. You don't have huge agricultural um, industries in some of these places. And those families are also the ones that are the hardest to reach with interventions because they don't necessarily have access to a city to get fortification or supplementation or anything like that. Um, you also interestingly have fairly significant amounts of bio-waste in these countries, um, particularly beer brewing waste. There's a very large millet beer brewing industry in Africa, um, and that waste is not used for massive amounts of things. Uh, similarly with rice bran, there's a lot of rice milling that happens and you get a byproduct which is the outside of the rice. Um, and some of it is used for animal feed, but there's also a fair bit that just kind of goes rancid because it's a fairly volatile byproduct. Um, you have a myriad of indigenous edible insects. You have a very strong culture of eating insects. So unlike in Europe, you're not trying to fight a culture if you work with introducing insects here. Um, and then also you have a very massively growing aquaculture industry. However, one of the biggest hurdles to this is the cost of feed in Africa. So farmers aren't willing to invest in expensive feed to produce fish when they're not 100% sure that it's going to work out. So all of these facts together is what spurred this project. Um, and the way, where it stems from is basically we've identified these main bio-wastes um, and we are going to be feeding them to crickets. Specifically, we work with uh, Gryllus bimaculatus, which is also known as the African field cricket. Um, the reason we work with this cricket is because it's fairly prolific in Africa, which is where this project is meant to be based and is meant to be sustainable. So if farmers are growing them, because the idea is, again, for farmers to be growing the crickets themselves on their own bio-waste, to be using then however they feel. And the two mainstreams that we envision then um, is the first option is to use it um, to target children in a fortification of the traditional food that's used for, for kids, uh, which tends to be a maize millet-based porridge that you can see in the picture there. Um, it's a very bland colored porridge. It's also very bland nutritionally. Uh, so it's not great on, it has enough calories generally, but it's very, very low on micronutrients. Um, a child would never be able to eat enough of the porridge to get all the micronutrients they need out of it. So if you could fortify something simple into it, like an insect flour, which most parents are already comfortable with, um, insects being a very like, common snack for kids and things like that, it would really help to throw in a lot of those micronutrients that it's missing. Um, again, within aquaculture as well, it's a very easy stream to kind of move in. Um, the insects wouldn't be expensive. You're not asking farmers to invest a lot of money. And fish are generally fairly happy to eat insects, depending on what you're growing. So the benefit, of course, to all of this, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, is that you have very low water needs, you have very low space requirements, you're converting waste into something useful, um, so a bio-waste that not much else could process, but insects generally can. Um, again, we're very much into it being culturally acceptable, so we're not trying to fight a culture, we're not trying to change eating habits, we're trying to work with us already there to make it successful. Um, Again, insects are a natural part of fish diets, they're high in multiple micronutrients, and they're also a valuable source of protein and energy. So of course there's several considerations within this project, one of the main ones being what is the bioavailability of iron in crickets. Um, so within iron when you're working you have heme iron, which is found in all livestock because they have blood and so they have hemoglobin. Um, when you have plants you have non-heme iron, obviously plants don't have blood, fairly simple thing. Um, insects, however, don't really fall into either of those categories. 
Um, so they don't have bloods and circulatory systems the way that livestock does, but they're also not like plants. So they do store their iron differently. Um, and every single entomologist that I've talked to goes, well, I don't really know if it's going to be more like heme or non-heme iron. Um, so that's definitely a consideration to take in because you need to know how much to fortify in, obviously. Um, there's the question of the success of farming on bio waste. Do they flourish on this bio waste? Um, are they happy eating this? What's the nutritional quality when you are feeding them on these bio wastes? Um, as was mentioned before, you know, how much is that impacting their nutritional status? Uh, what's the impact of processing methods? So if we're looking at working in a field, we're not going to have available to us you know, freeze dryers or minus 80 freezers or industrial mills. We're going to have to work within what's available. Uh, can you manipulate the nutritional content with what you're feeding? And of course, what's going to be appropriate for an aquaculture <laughs> diet? So the first thing we're doing is we're doing a big bio-waste feeding trial. Um, so we're not running on a small scale, which is what a lot of the trials have been done now. We're running on a very large scale. So we have four feed groups. We're doing three biological replicates, meaning we have 12 total colonies of insects. Um, and each colony is roughly 3,000 to 4,000 individual crickets, which equates to roughly three kilos of wet weight of cricket, uh, give or take a bit. Um, they're going to be fed for five weeks from hatching directly. Uh, we're going to test two life cycles, so we're going to actually breed our own crickets um, to test the fecundity to make sure that their bio-waste feed hasn't somehow negatively impaired their prolific nature afterwards. Um, and this trial is actually only starting in January, so we've just been doing a bit of preliminary work now. The feeds that we're going to be using is we've actually imported beer millet waste from Burkina Faso. That's what that suspicious looking substance is. That was fun getting through customs. Um, we have stabilized rice bran, which is the closest we can get to fresh, fresh rice bran. Um, as I've mentioned, fresh rice bran is very, very volatile due to its high lipid content. So it goes rancid very, very quickly, which is one of the issues with it and needing to use it quickly. Um, so unfortunately, it means we can't get it here because there's not many rice mills in the UK. So we have to use stabilized rice bran and assume that nutritionally it will be roughly the same except for the lipid content. Um, we're also making use of occasional vegetable scraps. That's not a main part of the diet, the vegetable scraps, because those are generally few and far between in villages in Africa. They're often repurposed for other things al already. So it's just kind of a once weekly handful of oddities. Um, so the first question is, are they going to eat it? Um, and that's something we've actually looked at. So these are, oh, that was meant to be a video. No, nope, sorry. Well, these are our little crickets. Um, and they're feeding on rice bran, which is the white bit down here, and then the beer waste is the brown bit, and they're very, very happy eating it. Um, every time we've eaten it, this is a colony of about 1,000. Every time we've thrown it in, they've eaten it within 24 hours, and we throw in uh, two or three handfuls each time. Um, and these are adult crickets um, that have been breeding, so they're very, very eager to eat it. The processing methods that we use are in keeping with traditionally available methods. Um, so we boil them in this very fancy kind of bain marie type setup that we have. Um, and then we use two drying methods right now. We use what is roughly equivalent to sun drying, which is a 45 degree Celsius dry. And then we use 120 degree Celsius dry, which is dry, which is roughly industry standard because we're doing comparisons across that. Um, and then we mill in a soil mill, which more or less mimics kind of a mortar and pestle action just on a larger scale. So within the drying, um, we've actually been running a comparison trial right now to see how samples dried at 45 compared to samples dried at 120. Um, the main concern within this is not so much the minerals changing, but lipids are fairly sensitive to changing temperatures of baking. Um, so we dry the ones at 45 degrees for 48 hours, um, although they were dry based on weight loss after about 36 hours, we left them in to confirm. Um, and then we dried the ones at 120 degrees for 24 hours, um, although after about five hours they were also fairly stable weight-wise. Um, so there's no significant visual difference between these. Um, you do get a smell difference, um, so the ones at 45 degrees do smell different, they smell more distinct and stronger, um, not bad or anything, just a different smell. Um, there were meant to be some lipid results here, um, but they are actually still running today on the gas chromatographer. Um, and the reason that we've been delayed is what I'm going to show you next, because we've had a very interesting thing happen with the milling. So for our milling, the process that we use, if you see up there, is we have a large steel chamber, um, and within that there is a steel disc. And so you fill the chamber around the disc, turn it on, the disc rotates around and grinds. So very much like a mortar and pestle. Uh, the interesting that, thing that happened is the first time that we milled it, we got this. 
Um, we milled it for two minutes, and we got a very solid clay substance um, that was somewhat oily. We milled the exact same sample again for 30 seconds and got a flour. Um, so if anyone has any ideas on why exactly this has happened, great to hear your thoughts. We're still scratching our heads. We've asked a few people. Um, but somehow how something happens in that extra minute and a half of milling and that crushing motion that perhaps releases something in the crickets. Um, we're leaning towards that they may be significantly oilier than we actually expected um, and that they're perhaps storing some of that in their exoskeleton that when you're doing short grinds otherwise doesn't release. Um, and so when you're doing longer high pressure grinds you get a very interesting clay substance. Um, we did actually put these back in the oven um, out of curiosity that they've been back in the oven for about three days now at 120 just to see maybe we didn't dry them properly. Um, and there hasn't been much weight loss. There's been about half a percent moisture loss. So it's definitely not water that's been left in there. Uh, nutritional quality, we are going to analyze all of those like nutrients. I'm not going to list them off for you. Um, we are also doing protein. Um, and we're doing repeat analysis throughout storage to see what happens as far as degradation on that side. Um, we're also doing microbial food safety analysis at Wageningen University. And that's going to be storage over one year at various temperatures. Um, again, to see how the food degrades and all of that to make sure that you know, it's something that can be stored. The iron bioavailability is going to be tested using an in vitro model. Um, so it's a CaCO2 cell assay. Uh, don't ask me anything else about that. I don't know anything. <laughs> um, and we're going to be testing pure insect flour. And then we're also going to be testing the insect flour combined with the porridge flour. So generally a maize millet flour um, to check if there's any sort of anti-nutrient inhibitory properties that happen when you've then got it you know, in the maize flour. Um, and then down here is just a quick kind of idea of, based on the bioavailability of the food, how much of that food then you need to feed in order to get the amount of um, iron that you want per age. So even if we only have a 5% bioavailability of the iron, which is quite low, this is lower than a lot of vegetables, um, you only need for a young child about 13 milligrams per 100 grams. So you don't necessarily need a ton to get up to that level. Um, but we do suspect that their bioavailability will be a bit higher and closer to meat rather than like a vegetable. So the aquaculture trials is another part of it because we wanted to have an option um, and a way to target older adults, particularly pregnant women, who may not be eating porridges and things like that because it's a very child niche area. Um, but fish consumption is on the rise in Africa and people are very happy eating it. They do a lot of um, co-farming with fish and rice patties and things like that, particularly tilapia and catfish, uh, which are two omnivorous fish and are also very happy eating insects um, and fairly varied diets. Uh, fish meal, of course, is not a sustainable source. Uh, the oceans are already overfished and breeding fish to feed to fish is a bit, <laughs> a bit backwards. There's a better way to go about it. Um, soya meal is predominantly used in some countries, so Egypt feeds solely soya meal and about half a percent, one percent fish meal. Um, but the fish don't do nearly as well on a pure soya meal diet. Um, so there has been previous work with black soldier flies that's proven very promising. Um, not 100% ideal yet, um, and we do think that this needs to be looked at kind of perhaps in an insect combination meal. So rather than going with one insect, it would be good to use a combination. Um, so we're going to be running experimental trials with tilapia at the Basa Research Center in Egypt. We're going to be running one to six month tank trials, um, kind of depending on how things go. We're going to be testing cricket meal, um, an insect mixed meal, um, and then also compare it to some standard feeds. So there's standard industrial feeds and then there's also standard farm feeds that subsistence farmers use, which tend to be a lot more varied um, and a lot more kind of vegetable scrap kind of thing based. Uh, part of the concern with the aquaculture and the fish feed um, comes to fish oil. Um, so the EPA and the DHA is a big thing in aquaculture and in fish feed. And it's the main reason that fish meal is actually fed to fish is to get the EPA and the DHA into the fish, not necessarily for the fish's benefit always, but often for our benefit because it's very good for us. The only way to get EPA and DHA into fish is to feed them fish because that is the only thing that holds it. Um, so we know that cricket lipids are fairly malleable. We've demonstrated this with linseed. So we've done a trial where we fed linseed and from the control group that was fed on a regular standard chicken feed mix to the experimental group that was fed solely on linseed for two weeks, we saw from a 1% to a 30% increase in alpha linolenic acid, which is the predominant lipid that you find in linseed. Um, so they are fairly malleable to that. 
So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be running a pilot trial with a plant that is a GM fish oil camelina that was produced out of Rothamsted Research. So this is a camelina plant, which is pictured up there, um, that has been modified to produce fish oil. Um, and it has, been, it has gone through successful field trials now, and they have shown that it does do this. Um, so we're going to be feeding a trial colony of about 1,000 fish the camelina to see if they are also able to store the fish oils. Not necessarily that it's the best future pathway to take to feed them this GM camelina, but just to demonstrate that it is viable and that it would be potentially very beneficial if that's possible to um, do on a larger scale. So just quickly, the future directions that we're going to be taking. Um, we are hoping to run full clinical fortification trials with the cricket flower on anemia status. Um, where exactly we're going to do this is unclear, potentially in Burkina Faso at a clinic there that has already run similar fortification trials. Um, tracking people over a six-month period to look at anemia status. Um, we're also running to, hoping to run full fish feed field trials in Zambia with smallholder farmers. They have a fairly strong smallholder aquaculture farm industry there, um, and so hoping to run some of the small-scale trials there where we would actually have them also growing the crickets themselves and feeding their own fish. And then finally, of course, the crickets do produce their own bio-waste, um, so they have the frass and they molt and there's some food that's not eaten. So we're going to be looking at processing that bio-waste as well, um, particularly if it does show that a mixed insect feed is better for the fish than a full cricket feed meal feed. Um, doing something like processing that bio-waste with mealworms or perhaps even black soldier flies, something that's happier to eat crud, um, basically, would be great for the future. Um, and then these are just our partners on it. So thank you. That was really, really interesting. Um, <laughs> sort of selfish thing, both my research is on millet and insects, so it was quite a cool combination of both. Um, so I'm going to start opening up the floor to questions. Okay, yeah? Hi. Um, so there was a product introduced in Africa once, I think it was called Sore Mite, mm. which, uh, which I think used termites to sort of fortify the solid porridge with, uh, um, with iron and protein. Mm. Um, compared to crickets, what do you see your sort of competitive advantage speaking uh, strictly products I think I think the big thing about crickets is so we spent a lot of time mulling over what insect to work with because we started in Burkina Faso we had eventually we had originally thought about working with the shea tree caterpillar which is what they predominantly eat there um, but what stopped us is that they're very difficult to breed um, and that's why time and time again we came back to cricket and locusts were the two we looked at originally is because they're very easy to breed um, they're very easy to breed, they're very hardy, they're very quick to breed, um, and so that's probably one of their biggest advantages, I would say. Um, and the ones we work with are also very large. Um, so a lot of people work with the, the house crickets or the banded crickets in experiments, and ours are about twice as big as that, um, and they grow in five weeks to that size instead of eight weeks. Um, so I think that's the biggest benefit. Um, the only reason we didn't use locusts is because of the biohazard associated with locusts. If you do breed locusts, there's significant risk you're undertaking that they might swarm and decimate a crop or something. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest biggest advantage with them. I've got a quick thing about the milling, actually. Um, the do you case. have answers? <laughs> it's just an idea, but I've been testing the mortars before, mixing up crickets and other brands of this and I found that if you do go a bit further... Going up with a bit of a paste. Yeah. It's not quite that um, as evident as it was in your diagrams. Another thing I've done is put in linseed and different sort of to make like a super grain ball, like mm. a super bomb. Yeah. yeah. Uh, of, it's, it's kind of like a bonbon, I suppose. <laughs> that creates something quite sticky. Right. But one thing I noticed is, that is after blitzing it for a bit of time, it was quite hot. So I was wondering if there's heat in the cooking process that yeah. was causing the oils to sort of render, I suppose, a little bit. We've thought something similar. Our mills don't get particularly hot, um, so you can feel them immediately after if, if they're hot. Um, and we, we honestly don't know. We've, we're running lipid analysis on both of the samples right now, so the one that is the clump and one that is the flower, um, because we can't really explain as to what's happened in this minute and a half to change it so drastically. Um, because for ages we thought we just hadn't dried them enough and we couldn't figure out how to get them to mill, and it was really frustrating. Um, but so we are looking at it. Um, I, from the extraction process, we haven't run the analysis yet. The extractions look the same um, visually, which doesn't necessarily say much. 
Um, although the 45 degree extraction looks very, very different from the 120 extractions. So it'll be, I'm hoping something turns up different. Um, I have a suspicion it probably won't. <laughs> Yeah. And then I found, I stored them for like over a year now, and it's actually penetrating the bag, the oily substance, so I, I'm not sure if it makes a difference, like how long I think it still has that property that will yeah. seep out eventually. Yes, sir, it's very interesting. Um, I think they are a lot oilier than perhaps anticipated by a lot of people. Okay, and, one, and um, I just want to say, in hindsight, actually, could you introduce yourselves very, very quickly, just because it seems really interesting what you're saying, and maybe everyone would like to know. Also, that's good for the audio. Yes. Right? It's going to be yes. all the audio, so if you say your name and affiliation, and then ask a question. So we're very, uh, before we get to your question, if you three would just very quickly give a brief sure. summary. Um, <laughs> I'm Indrunil Chatterjee, a researcher at Oxford Brookes University, and I look at applying cognitive neuroscience to endomorphism, so I look at sort of the... Uh, neurological and psychological basis of insect food consumption. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Andy Holcroft, I'm um, chef and director of Grove Kitchen. So we started a restaurant up in Wales on the bug farm, looking at how to integrate entomology into our normal sort of cultural diets here in the UK, I suppose. Trying to make it a bit more, I mean, lots of other people are doing it, like a bit more of a, a normalcy rather than a novelty. And we've been having fantastic responses. We're basing it, we have to base it a lot on science, obviously, so that's why it's mainly populated and with um, my partner, Dr. Sarah Bain, is also entomologist as well. Um, so, yeah, it's great to be able to base it all on science and research and then create tasty products at the end of the day to try and create a market for entomology. Um, my name is Ellen Tatlow. I'm with the University of Nottingham and I am looking at manipulating the nutritional content of insects with food for fish. Okay, and now on to you, and please introduce yourself. I'm Ian Fault, I'm from Zimbabwe, I'm a farmer from Zimbabwe. You spoke about um, mapani worms compared to crickets, and your processing on your crickets. Heat, what is heat, what factor does heat play in your process on your nutrients? If you look at mapani worms, for example, they're sun-dried, mm. them. Yeah. No other processing takes place, that's the reason why they're so high in protein. Yeah. Um, I'm touching on a few other, another gentleman mentioned um, your feed content and your crickets. Yes, feed does play an important role, yep. uh, in your nutritional value in your, in your cricket feed. We're looking at three different species. We're running a lot of trials at the moment, black soldier fly, crickets, and the worms. Mm. Um, substrate plays a critical role in, in all three. You mentioned um, uh, brewer's grain, sub saharan in Africa, you don't get is grain yeah. for free. It's, it's, um, it has a market. Um, dairy farmers buy up everything. Mm. So you having availability in and and Burkina Faso, if you're talking yeah. environmental, you're moving it from one part of that, that Africa to the next part. So we're talking carbon footprint, etc. Et so you're going to look at substrate within the area that you feed. Yeah. So for example, we're looking at, at a, an invasive species of, of plant um, uh, a weed grown basically on, on Lake Kariba mm. and a lot of other waterways to feed our um, black soldier fly. Mm. And the, the black soldier fly will be processed to feed the crickets and that, that. Right. Yeah, no, of course, it is a big concern. I mean, it's, it's impossible to create a model that's going to apply to the entirety of Africa. Um, we focus in Western Africa because of the, where we have partners, um, where the beer waste is readily available, um, as well as from what we hear in Kenya um, and Egypt. It is fairly available there along with the rice brand. Um, so we don't actually do much work in South Africa, that area, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, we are looking at all of those factors as well. The heat thing in the ovens is a big thing that we're looking at, and we are running that analysis because we have dried them at different temperatures, so sun equivalent and kind of industrial um, equivalent. Um, and it, we're not necessarily anticipating a huge difference in our like micronutrient content, um, but the lipids do seem very, very sensitive to that, and so that's a big decision on that part to make. Um, but yes, of course, definitely considerations. Okay, we have time for one more quick question. Oh, that was so. There was so much <laughs> difference in the raising of hands. Okay, we could also we have tea and coffee now, so if you have any more questions, we can ask them. Later. But yeah, go for it. Me. Right, yeah. uh, Jane Joseph from University of Southampton, another workshop. 
Um, I'm just curious, um, maybe an odd question, but I wonder what your research background was in, so whether it was like biology or something else, um, and also if you could explain a little bit about how you actually perform the nutritional analysis, kind of which steps, what kind of equipment do you use and that kind of thing. So my background's actually not in like a bioscience, so it's also fairly new to me. Um, as far as like the analysis on that side, for the protein analysis, we use something called a leco machine, um, which looks at nitrogen and carbon, and it basically just works by burning the substance and then measuring kind of the nitrogen and carbon that comes out. Um, and s then for the lipids, you do um, an extraction using various solvents. Um, so depending on which type of extraction you're doing, um, you do use different solvents and different combinations, and then you end up using a gas chromatographer, um, which again basically vaporizes the substance and based different elements have different weights, and so based on when they come out, the machine can tell you which um, lipid it is. Um, similarly with the lipids, you can also use a mass spectrometer, which works on very much the same basis. Um, and then for the rest of the minerals, we use an ICP OES, uh, which again, you go through a digestion process of the material, um, and then it goes into a machine that, at this stage, I'm not exactly sure what happens in the machine. Um, but they all work on the very similar concept of different um, elements have different weights. And so based on that, you know when they can come, like what time they come out um, of a machine, and you can say what they are and how much is there. Okay, everyone, um, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you so much for that.